Care Circle, the nonprofit programming arm of Care's Books and More, the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore, 46 years to be exact. We are excited to have you here for a celebration of hood feminism, notes from the women that a movement forgot. Thank you to our partners at the Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American culture and history. Throughout tonight's event, a research librarian, Morris to be exact, from Auburn Avenue will be dropping supplementary resources into the chat. Please know that the chat will stay up after the event, so don't so you don't need to divide your attention during the program. It'll be here for you to see later. If you have a question for the panel, please put them in the ask a question box at the bottom center of your screen. And if you see a question that you like that someone else has already asked, you can upvote it to make sure it gets seen and asked. Finally, as a 45-year-old radical independent feminist bookstore in the South, it means a lot when you buy your books directly from us. So if at any time tonight you wanna to buy Hood Feminism for yourself or as a gift, please go ahead and click that teal button at the bottom of your screen and it will take you right to the book on our website. Now, let me introduce our guest. Mickey Kendall is a New York Times best-selling writer, speaker, and blogger whose work has appeared in the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, the Guardian, Times, Salon, Ebony, Essence, and elsewhere. In addition to Hood Feminism, she is also the author of Amazon's Abolitionist and Activist, A Graphic History of Women's Fight for Their Right, and co-editor of the Lucas-nominated anthology, Hidden Youth, as well as a part of the Hugo-nominated team of editors at Fireside Magazine. A veteran, she lives in Chicago with her family. And in conversation with her, we have Jaleesa T. Jackson, a mother, a black queer feminist, mother, writer, and interdisciplinary scholar researching and teaching about critical theories of race, gender, class, sexualities, disability, and disability. They are the director of community engagement at the Feminist Women's Health Center, where they lead the development of a comprehensive vision, strategy, implementation, and evaluation plan for all community engagement programs and initiatives. Across her work in the classroom and in the community, her focus has been on the ways that systems of oppression structure opportunities in society, and their daily work has been within communities who are marginalized throughout these structures. Please welcome Mickey Kendall and Jaleesa T. Jackson. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Wow, thank you for being here. Um, I've been telling everybody all week that I've been looking forward to this conversation, um, namely because as I was moving through the text, um, I felt like with each chapter, I had uh, my own sort of narrative or my own sort of story um, that was in alignment with a story that you told. Um, and so thank you for being so vulnerable with us with this, with this piece. Um, I think it was, sort of a pathway for those of us who have had similar um, lived experiences to connect with you and your story. Um, but I wanna start us off by making sure we have a, a shared understanding for the folks um, here who may have not yet gotten the book, um, but I'm sure they plan to, or they will plan to after our conversation. Um, how do you define um, hood feminism? And why did you uh, believe that there was a necessity for a term such as, as hood feminism to be defined? So I define hood feminism as the lived day-to-day -day work that you see a lot of women who are often go unrecognized. And by women, I'm not just saying cis women, I mean trans, I mean non-binary, genderqueer, you insert your definition there. But they are doing a lot of work in communities that then is not seen as feminist and sometimes is not recognized in any way, to be honest, right? And that might be fighting for schools to have what they need. That might be not uh, violence intervention programs that might be around hunger, it might be around housing, it might be around general poverty or medical care, you know, policing in particular, police brutality. And I was one of those girls, right? I think they're calling us hot Cheeto girls now, right? <laughs> Hot pickles, down ladies in the middle, that was me. I know some of y'all did peppermint sticks, but not me, I don't like that. <laughs> um, and the thing was, everyone rushed to tell girls like us what we couldn't do, right? Mm -hmm. Don't get pregnant, don't do this, don't, don't, don't. You didn't hear a lot of people except for those same underappreciated women and caregivers and whatever in the community telling us what we could do. 
Right. And so for a lot of things in feminist spaces at first, it felt like it wasn't for people like me, like at all, right? We were a problem to be solved. We were a situation to address. Mm -hmm. And then I get to a point where, you know, I'm in college and all of this, and I'm taking classes like psychology of sexual harassment and all of this stuff. And we're talking, this is going to be a weird light bulb moment, but I'll explain in a second. We're talking about, you know, sexual harassment cases, and we're talking about that. And there's a girl, a white girl, who keeps talking about how, why do black women do this? This is like her favorite question, right? Why are black people, insert thing here? And she would always say it, and then she would get this little cutesy smile on her face, and I might not have cared for her as a person. <laughs> but she kept saying she was a feminist. And I was like, hmm. why are we having these conversations, right? Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, though, I'm a single parent, I'm already a veteran at that point. I've gotten a divorce. I'm living in the projects while I'm in college. And all of this is going on. And I start to think the problem here isn't the term feminism. The problem here is the people who are using it and how they're using it. Right. And I didn't identify with it. For a long time, I described myself as an occasional feminist, right? Like there are parts that I agreed with, but then there are these big chunks about like, how to be a CEO and girl boss stuff where I would be like, well, that's nice. But like, what about the people who are not guaranteed a meal or a place to lay their head tonight? Why are we talking about being a CEO and not about, and then I didn't actually originally think that this book could happen when I had the hashtag and I kind of lost my temper. Things happen when I get mad. It happens. No, it happens. (laughs) Right. I thought, and I said at the time, nobody wants to hear this stuff. I'm just going to say it anyway. So the book kind of comes, the term and the book kind of come out of that and out of the fact that when I was the target of a bunch of, um, I think they call themselves pro-life. I call them forced birthers. Um, when I was a target of theirs, it was not feminists, big name mainstream feminists who were offering me real concrete resources, right? right. Right. It was it was literally like the daughter of so and so's mama has an apartment in the back of her spot. Hey, if you need anything, let us know. You know, my nephew and they just be riding around the street all the time anyway. They can ride around by your house, that kind of thing. Right, right. And it was such a different thing to have people offering like shelter, safety, food versus what I was getting. I think I still have the email somewhere. Well, we would love it if you would come speak at this rally. We want you to come testify in Congress. We want you to do all of this other public work right. with your face attached in the middle of these death threats because that's what we need, right? It's very easy to end up a martyr right. whether you ever intended to be one or not. Right. It is not easy to survive. Right, right, right. And especially, and especially for black women and especially for black poor women. And so I really liked, one of the things I really liked about your book was that you made sure to pay attention to even the women who are left out of um, a feminist dialogue that claims to center um, women that have a marginalized identity, right? Um, because when we look along class lines, when we add layer in um, where folks are like uh, geographically located and some of the threats that they might face just um, as a matter of fact of where they live, which street, which block they live on, right? Um, I think that it, it, you, you make it more clear um, that an issue that in my brain as a black feminist, I'm saying, um, of course, gun violence is a feminist issue, right? But this is sort of like a novel idea for mainstream feminists, is what you're saying in your in your text. Um, and you proclaim that Chicago's problem with gun violence was America's problem with gun violence. What do you mean by that? So I'm going to tell people who may or may not know this. America actually has more guns than people, and not by a small margin. Something like 50 million. It might be 75 million. That number goes up. It doesn't go down. So there's something like 325 to 350 million people in America right now. I know our numbers are even shakier there. We're closing in on 400 million guns. And until the pandemic, daily, sometimes several times a day, you were having mass shootings in America. Right. right? But what you saw on TV was Chicago gun violence. 
violence. Right. And I'm not going to say Chicago doesn't have gun violence. We absolutely do. But our death rates were not as high as a dozen other cities. And I know that because that data is there, right? Right. Our deaths were mainly happening because of proximity to a hospital. We weren't having any more shootings. We still aren't having any more shootings in other places. Right. Or capita, right? Right. But what we are having, which also kind of gets concealed over, is that we have a two cartel plus gangs plus police brutality problem in Chicago. Right. So relatively speaking, it could be worse. I lived in Chicago when it was worse. Right. Meanwhile, though, you have parts of whether we're talking Colorado or Wisconsin or California or Texas, where when you go and you look at the paper, how we classify it as a mass shooting right means that if two people got shot we say it's not a mass shooting but they may have intended to shoot however many people. right right we also think it's normal like like the weather right today's risks of shooting at the mall are so tomorrow's risk of shooting in schools now always now when we're talking about covid and young people right. and their attitudes around covid I, i'm confused that we don't understand we told an entire generation, several generations of children, because I was one of them, that yeah, 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 the risk of gun violence is out there, but you still got to go to school, you still got to go to work, you still got to, you still got to, you still got to. So we taught them that death was possible at right. any time, right. and they still had to go about their life. Right now, we're saying, but what about? Well, you you got to pick a message, and so America loves guns more than it loves children. Sure. More than it loves safety, more than it loves freedom, more than it loves anything else. Yeah. And if you think that I am exaggerating, I am going to remind you that currently people who brought bombs and guns to Congress to kill congressmen, <laughs> folks are still trying to say, don't take my guns away. Right. No one's been trying to take your guns away, but you keep proving why someone should consider it. Right, right, right. True. And you even you even lift up um, gun violence as not only a community health, but a, pu a public health issue. Right. And therefore, it should be seen as a feminist issue. What in particular about gun violence makes it feminist? OK, so. <laughs> But that's from violence in this specific way. If we're talking about domestic violence, if we're talking about assault, even if we're talking about police brutality, women, especially women of color, are not safe from gun violence. Right. They, even if they do not end up dead, they are more likely to end up injured, right? We have no shortage of stories of a 12 year old girl in her bed, Breonna Taylor in her house, right? 70, 80, 90 year old grandmothers in their homes. Right. And your risk of dying from an abusive partner. I want to say it triples. The data keeps getting shakier because COVID is now. But yeah. if a gun is present, you are more likely to see someone die. Right. In that house. Right. And yet, yet, we will then say, well, yes, women are dying at the hands of their partners. Yes, grandmothers, children. Girl, girl children are afraid to go to school, but that's a problem for somewhere else. It's a problem for someone else. Those are all supposed to be people the feminist movement cares about. Right. Those are all people feminism will turn to to support reproductive health or anything else. Where is that? You know, solidarity can't be a one way street. Where is the solidarity? Right, right, right. Absolutely. I'm here. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I got frozen for a second. Yeah. Thanks for um, making it more clear for folks um, about it. I think um, so. I work in. I work at a health clinic, and it's not just a health clinic though. It's an independent abortion provider, um, and we're also a reproductive justice organization. And so we have um, we provide direct services to folks, and then we also have our advocacy arm. Um, and so. Kind of the way that we think about reproductive justice is sort of in the vein of how it was originally conceived by the founding mothers is what we call the 12 black women that coined the term um 
And one of the things that set that framework aside from the reproductive health and reproductive rights framework was that reproductive justice um, thought about uh, women's health, but more specifically black women's health is at the center of that um, in a more comprehensive way. Um, and so they set up these four tenets to kind of um, sort of capture what their priorities were for um, the term as well as the movement. The first was the right to have a child, which is something that seems very simple, right? Everyone should have that right. The second was the right to not have a child um, and the options for ending any unwanted or unplanned pregnancies. The third was the right to raise our children in um, healthy and sustainable environments without the fear or the threat of violence from the state or individuals. And this is a tenet that is not spoken about uh, very often, um, but it's a tenet that's really, really important because it, um, it considers other aspects of violence. It says the threat of violence from individuals or the state, state violence being considered a threat to our reproductive health or state violence being considered um, reproductive oppression. Um, and so I just, as I was reading your book and I'm going through like the weaving and the issues because they're all interconnected. And I think you did a really good job of um, highlighting how the issues of gun violence is related to the issues of patriarchy is related to the issues of um, sexual violence, right? And so I think it's really important for the feminist movement um, at large to be thinking about all of our issues as interconnected. And so I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about hunger and housing. Um, these were two chapters from your text that um, really spoke to me personally. Um, lots of your lived experiences mirrored many of mine. I too had a child young and um, was a single parent in college um, and had to navigate social services to try to take care of myself and my child and ha came up to weird restrictions that didn't really make logical sense for what the programs are proclaiming to, uh, to be there for. Um, so having a real hands-on like struggle and experience in that in that system and so i appreciate you lifting that up um and in the in the sections on hunger and housing there were some themes that i noticed um that came up and one of those was the theme of, of criminalization of poverty and i wanted to i wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about criminalization um as a feminist issue what makes criminalization um and the reverberations of criminalization a feminist issue so one of the things, and we're seeing more of this, I'm going to use, and I'm, her name is eluding my brain right now. She was just, her ex called and reported that she had left her kids in the hotel room while she was at work, right? Now, A, I think my first thought is if you had time to call the police, you had time to go see about your kids. So mm -hmm. I have a host of questions. Right. B, the fact that she was living in a hotel tells me she was already in a not so great situation and may in fact have left that person because of abuse. And it's often a, a middle stage. Right. And everyone kept saying, well, why didn't she have whatever? And I was like, so A, it's a pandemic. So whatever babysitter she could have had, if they got sick, lining up another one is a problem. B, I know what sitters charge. Um, and she's working fast food. So these right. numbers, this math don't math. Right. But she got arrested, she got charged, she might lose her children. And granted, the internet has raised a bunch of money for her. She will be able to afford the lawyer, that would mean that probably doesn't happen. But she's one of dozens of women that we've seen make, frankly, very mundane choices, right? Whether it is enrolling your child in a school that's outside the district. Right. Um, whether it is, there was one where she had a job interview, so she brought her child with her to the mall and had her child staying at another table on her sight line, and they still tried to say it was abandonment. Yep. Right? With all of these kinds of stories. And we say to people who are poor, you should be doing everything you can to get out of poverty. And then we punish you if the everything you can runs anywhere near what could be perceived as a line that was neglectful. Doesn't mean the kids aren't fed, doesn't mean the kids aren't safe. Right. It then means you're not performing care in the way in which we think you should, right? right. I'll never forget when my kids were little, I had a neighbor. I would sometimes go outside because small children. And it never left the area where they were. But I had a neighbor tell me one day, you need to watch out for Miss So-and-so. I said, why? 
And she says, oh, her favorite thing is to call children's services on people. What do you mean her favorite thing? Now, mind you, we live across the street from a park. So half the time I would take my kids outside so they could run around in the park. Right. But sometimes I would just go stand outside and get some air. Right. And I, what do you mean? And she says, oh, no, she's done it twice that I know of. Wow. Why? <laughs> right? Like these aren't, you know, kids are not being burned. They're not being beaten. They're not being... She says, oh, I don't know. I've had that conversation with her before. I have no idea, but she's a busybody, basically. Okay, fine. You know, I'll keep that in mind. So then one day, the, the woman she was talking about is talking to me, and she kind of hints around at it. And my state has a specific age at which you can. And my oldest was that age. She was just baby-faced and very skinny. Right. And uh, she said something, and I said, oh, I just realized how old you think my kids are. And I answered her, and you could see the disappointment almost fall into her. Head. No right. way. Yes. Yes. Now, mind you, technically, we should have looked like we were fine. I had a spouse. This is, I have, I am working. He is working. Sometimes these kids are on one on a holiday weekend. I'm going to go outside because... Ooh, yeah, I need a second. I need a right. second. Right. And especially because my oldest was already, though we didn't quite realize he had about to do that launch in puberty. So mm -hmm. maybe you have preteens. Mm -hmm. Know exactly what was happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, and so I'm thinking about this. And I had had other brushes with that kind of thing. And I've always been, fortunately, pretty lucky about that in the sense that I can talk good and I can kind of spin my way out of, you know, because it's not even that it's kids left unsupervised, right? We're seeing people who are poor have to figure out childcare or whatever, right? And people saying, well, you should have had somebody watch the kids. They didn't have anyone to watch the kids, right? Whether this is a mom who used to be in foster care, right. whether this is she got called in for a shift or she was supposed to be off shift, her relief didn't show up, whatever. Right. right. While all of that is happening, though, states have gutted the same child care subsidy programs that used to exist exactly. that were created to address this. Exactly. States have criminalized poverty in such a way that I have seen now with that you can't leave your kids in the car when you run in the store or whatever. Yep. Right. At what point do we talk about how someone who is by herself and the kid doesn't want to get out of the car and the thing she doesn't want to deal with is fighting with the kid just to go into the store for you to call because the kid is having a tantrum? Like, which, right. Right. where are we going? We got to pick a way in which moms get some kind of support, which parents get some kind of support. Right. Or we admit that we don't think the poor people should have children. Right? Exactly. exactly. We, we we will judge them and criminalize, and this is my weird example, but I've seen this a few times, people talking about how parents should be punished for feeding those kids soda, whatever. And I'm going to bring a flint from now to the end of time. I would rather that kid have soda made with clean water than lead in their water. Right, right. Right? So you got to pick your poison is what basically we tell poor people. And then you better pick the right poison. Right, right. Because if you pick the wrong one, we're going to punish you. But if you pick the other one, we're also going to punish you. Exactly, exactly. So it's set up, it's set up that way um, from the beginning, right? And so mm -hmm. I remember when I saw that very story that you were describing because, you know, I'm on Twitter. It, people were posting it and saying really wild things. And I remember thinking, I, I think the oldest child was 10. And I remember I was the oldest child of four, of the oldest mm -hmm. of four. And my mom worked long shifts in the hospital. If there was not a babysitter, I was 10. I had an infant brother. I had a, a brother that was two years younger than me. I needed to babysit these kids. They had to get babysat. It was, uh, and so that's what you, that's what you talk about in, in your book, right? Like we leave poor people with impossible decisions, decisions between what? Houselessness and feeding your child or the ability to feed your child or and the, or the, the health the, insurance. Right, right, right. So it's just, it's, um, we leave folks with impossible decisions and then we criminalize and shame them for making the decisions that they had to make under the conditions they were living in. Um, and so you make that really, really clear um, in your text. And so I think that in the context of how we address poverty 
um, within feminism, um, where should the conversation be beginning? I'm gonna say a thing that's gonna have somebody call me a socialist. You'll be all right, you'll be fine. <laughs> I'm gonna point out that a universal basic income tied to inflation, right? And we can put whatever your actual earnings means test on later, whatever, right? Can structure, weird structure without me. But what we are spending to incarcerate, mm -hmm. to have child protective services stepping in for people who are neither neglectful nor abusive, but who are poor, Right. right. And that's not to say I'm saying let the people who are actually mistreating their kids off the hook. But there are a lot of kids who end up in foster care because of parents who just don't have resources. Right. Um, right. What we are spending in the most backwards way could go to supporting families. Right. And I know that there's a, a thing for when it's three fifty a month or whatever. And that's not bad. But left to me, I would say more like three grand a month. Right. Right. Um, and the reason I say three grand a month is that we want people to stay home or we want people to be able to go home when kids are sick or whatever, right? Like in search of thing here. Well, we know a lot of people who are working as essential workers who be don't want someone who you're going to pay not enough money because minimum wage should be 20 24 i think is where the number actually works out you should be looking at a, at a basic income supplement you should be looking at feminism fighting for everyone to be we have more houses than we have people without houses right for everyone to be housed right there are all of these ghost buildings in many cities i don't know about atlanta but i know chicago is developing them in new york and, that, and other cities have them we put up luxury condo buildings that no one lives in right Right. As they're just they're not they're money laundering. Mm -hmm. That's all they're for. Right? <laughs> and that's what they're for. That's what you're doing. Like on some Ozark type. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me there's there's a place that's like eight grand a month that opened up in Chicago. And I was like, because it's a three bedroom for right. eight thousand dollars. You okay. just want drug money to come through. Yes. Yeah, I do. Yes. Yeah. You just want white, you just want white collar crime rolling through these doors. Okay. Correct. So, but no, so this is the thing, right? We have no reason for people to be going without resources, except we have some weird mentality that your bootstraps are going to pull you up by, and you can't lift your foot with bootstraps, right? Like, what am I gonna do? Bootstrap my way, that doesn't even make sense. But what we could do, and feminism could be doing this, and by feminism, I mean the push for candidates, you know, that legislative arm we're trying to bend at any given point, we could make sure that the people who have the least have access to support. Right. And this is not actually as much money as we're currently spending. We could reduce the number of people in jail right. if we made survival possible, right? Because most crime, not all, but most crime, especially around property and vice, they're driven by poverty. Right, right. Right? Even right. when we talk about people committing welfare fraud, which really happens or whatever. But let's say that we say that some kind of fraud is going on. It's because you can't buy toilet paper with food stamps. Exactly. Exactly. You can't buy the rest of a household's needs with food stamps. Exactly. Right? That shadow economy that appears, and I know people want to judge and say, oh, they were buying like 37 bottles of liquor and cigarettes. Mm, a $5 a day per person? That's no. <laughs> no. No, that doesn't add up. <laughs> like, Susan, your math doesn't add. It doesn't add um, I get very sarcastic on this topic, sorry. I just I find it ridiculous that America resents poverty while it requires yeah. poverty to present this myth of luxury. Right, right. And I think that that's a really good point that you bring up. Um, and on the housing tip in Atlanta, we're seeing much of the same, right? We're seeing rapid gentrification, right? I live in Southwest Atlanta in the neighborhood of Pittsburgh, which was founded as like the black Mecca, right? Um, and um, it's just being rapidly gentrified. Um, uh, so housing costs are going up. People who have been here for decades are being pushed out of their neighborhoods. Um, and so you have this housing crisis layered on with Atlanta having the um, highest rates of income inequality, right? 
And we know that when we look at wages, wages are understood as a feminist issue, like, right? Like women make this much to every dollar that a man makes. And then when you um, complicate that narrative by layering in uh, black women and, you know, other women, Latinx women, um, you start to see like this disparity uh, widen um, and become even more, just become even more wide. And so I think that um, the, the aspects of around housing are, is just something that is really relevant to folks today. Um, and it's interesting that, and I agree with the fact that housing is not very neatly situated as a feminist issue, right? Like you mm -hmm. have your organizations that focus on like tenant rights um, and they organize tenants and they do housing rights. But I think folks have a hard time with marrying housing as a feminist issue. So um, what has been helpful to you to think of them as uh, not one and the same, maybe, but um, definitely issues that inform each other? Oh, no, I think they're absolutely one and the same. Here's why. Because having stable housing is foundational to everything else that you did, right? Mm -hmm. And whether that is because you are a renter or you want to be an owner, because the peg that sort of gets lost, although we're starting to talk about it, even how housing value is assessed is based right. on identity, right? Right. So we've already established that they will decide a Black family's house is worth less just because Black people live there. We there's plenty of data in multiple states. Well, what happens is that housing, you know, headed by a single woman, headed by a woman who is the wrong, wrong race, who is modified for disability reasons, whatever, how are those homes being valued? How accessible is that house or is housing in general for that person, right? We see a lot of these new projects being built up and I am not, I don't need a mobility device, but I have friends who do. And there are places I have walked in where I am like, so did nobody that had ever been near a person who needed wheels right. or king come in here, right? Right. And then you have those conversations and you start to realize that they then are locking big groups of women and their families out of these places in advance, right? Right. You're not going to have a lot of elders in that shiny new building with the slick floors <laughs> mm -hmm. because those slick floors are dangerous if you have unstable footing. Mm -hmm. The three steps up to get into the building, those cute little with no ramp, that means someone who needs an assistive device is probably not going to get in that building. Buildings that are unfriendly to children, that are, you know, there's all of these ways where you can punish women and their families for existing, where you can lock out people who earn less, which is more likely to be women, so forth, so on. So it's never not a feminist issue. It's just a question of whether or not the feminists who have the mic have ever had to worry about their own housing, right? The world is a very different place when your parents paid your rent till you were 30 okay. than it is when you paid rent at 19. Okay. <laughs> we not the same. <laughs> You're not having the same experience. Right. Like, if I, yes, thank you for looking that up. And I think that that ties into even like um, the way that people engage young people, um, the adultist way that people engage young people um, by assuming that they're young. So that means that they don't necessarily have responsibilities. Um, not like completely dismissing or ignoring the fact that some young people had to contribute to um, household utilities, bills. Some young people were responsible for maintaining a household. Um, I certainly was. Um, so the assumption that because of age that dismisses um, some of these very real, tangible, uh, material experiences of poverty um, and how that impacts a young person's um, experience of their youth, right? Mm -hmm. We talk about adultification and, um, you know, like who's, who's allowed their innocence and their youth um, and who has to sort of, sort of, their socialization is sort of like pushed along at a much more rapid speed because, um, because of who they are. We have um, a question here that um, Brittany wanted to ask. They said, mm -hmm. I'm a third grade teacher and we're about to focus on women in um, history next month uh, for Women's History Month. What is something you wish your third grade teacher told you or supported you with as a little girl? We talk so much about um, current events, acceptance, equal rights, racism, and discrimination. My kiddos cheered when I said it was Women's History Month next month, but I want to support them where it's most needed. 
So one of the things I wish I had had more of, and it's not that I had none of it, I had a really good third grade teacher, Ms. Longley, I still remember her name. But she made a point of showing us, and it sticks out to me, both in Black History Month and the next month, Black women who did things that were not just the civil rights movement. It wasn't a knock on the civil rights movement, but she wanted to show us a range, right? She's why I know about stagecoach Mary and Bessie Springfield and all of these other people. And for me, I wish in third grade in particular, there was such a focus on slavery, at least then in U.S. history curriculum and the civil rights movement. You would almost think black people have been invented in time to be enslaved, yes. free, disappeared, and reappeared in time for the civil rights movement. That's not right? what happened. That's not what happened. Okay. Not what happened. <laughs> and so she made a point of teaching us I now know that this had nothing to do with the standard curriculum. Like I didn't know it at the time. It was subversive. But she taught us that history, some of that history between the end of slavery and before the civil rights movement, right? So we got to see a lot of pictures of black women as part of Women's History Month. And right. she brought in some other stuff about indigenous women, Asian women. And she was really ahead of her time. I didn't know at the time. But I feel like a lot of times, especially in Women's History Month, we tend to focus on white women. Um, the women of color we do bring in fought for like labor rights, or we don't bring in any of the cool stuff that isn't struggling right. to stay alive. And that doesn't mean it's not cool to fight the good fight, but there's a lot of women in history. And now like, I'm only on the soapbox because I wrote the other book and that book talks about some of this. There's a lot of pictures in there. Um, we made it pretty. It may or may not be good for third graders, but you can take a look and get ideas of people. Yeah. Um, but the thing that was great was getting to see that women had always been important, been relevant, and part right. of, and women who looked like me. Right. Right. Women who were every variety of color, right? Like it wasn't just Ruby Bridges getting things thrown at her, it was astronauts too. It was Ruby Bridges growing up, right? Like, there's this whole space. Josephine Baker being a spy? Yeah. I tell you, that was the coolest thing in my life. Right. Why was I left out? I'm like, why didn't why didn't y'all tell me this? <laughs> Listen, and I've had I've been a Josephine Baker fan growing since, but when I mentioned it the first time to someone who had not had the benefit of my third grade teacher, that's when I realized we weren't all learning the same history. And sometimes the thing that would be best for kids of color. I, I feel especially is to see all of the things they could be. Yeah. Right. And it's not to say there's anything wrong with showing them activists, but show them activists and entertainers and writers and all of these people so that they feel like they have a choice. Yeah. 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 I think that's really, really important and kind of leads um, to the conversation around parenting while marginalized. Um, and just like, I think the importance of teaching our young people possibility, like, um, as you mentioned, like going beyond what is typically taught as things that they can be and, that, and affirming the creativity and the exploration and the experimentation and maybe you'll change your mind and maybe you won't and whatever you decide will be right for you. Um, so can you talk a little bit about um, what sort of, I mean, I, of course your kids probably inspired like this chapter, but what made you feel like it needed to be included um, in this collection, um, Parenting While Marginalized? So one of the things is that um, my oldest is maybe non-binary, we're figuring things out, right? And we had this like sort of, I, I, I handled various parts of coming out wrong and I didn't handle it wrong in the way that you might be cringing for. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to know. So uh, we were about to die laughing. That baby came to tell me that they were interested in people who were not heterosexual. And I was like, okay. Because I didn't know it was a secret. Yeah. In my defense, I had no idea we did we were, I just thought we weren't talking about it yet. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay. And we're upset. I said, why are you upset? What's wrong with you? You did. You raised the dishes. Like I handled it, <laughs> and then it came out like we thought you would have more of a reaction. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When I tell you that you are my child, 
I mean, that's that's it. That's you always got to see at this table. You bring home who you bring home now, right? If they mean or they're too old or whatever, right? That's you taking their life in their hands in your hands. Okay. Like you bring that to me. Some people are not interventionists. You come in here with, with any any issues. You know your mama. You gotta. You know your mama. So make you know make right. your daddy will your daddy will help me hide. What's that? So just right. know that. Right. <laughs> like that was our conversation. <laughs> but one of the things about raising my kids, honestly, is that most of the struggles I had were not with my kids. Like sometimes my kids were on one, but it was other people. Right. 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 I had to have these weird, stupid battles with authority figures. Right. Yeah. So my oldest had a food allergy. One of the people at the daycare talked to a friend who was a nurse. I, to I get, I, and then we got to fight, right? And we got to clarify, right? Um, yeah. My younger son is on the spectrum, and they tried to tell us originally that that child would not be able to do anything. Mm -hmm. So you're wrong, and you don't have good credit. And like, here we go. Here is the fight, right? Right. right. And. My identity made some of that more difficult. And then I started writing in public. I started doing things. And suddenly things got a little easier. But they got easier because a lawyer could answer an email. Yeah, exactly. Right? And I feel like a lot of times when we are saying to parents in marginalized communities that they're not doing enough or they're not doing whatever, they're fighting an unseen uphill battle. Yeah. And they're fighting an unseen uphill battle with stupid, right? <laughs> Right. I have brought in the doctor's note that says this child has a milk allergy and you decide that the, the allergy doesn't exist because some friend you know is a nurse and I'm a black mom with a baby face. That's really what happened. Right. So you now, can possibly know what's best for your child. Right. And now you got a problem because I'm talking to your boss and Department of Children and Family Services because you right. let the chubby cheeks fool you. Right. And you right. probably that, that, that child, 19 hours of labor. 19. Okay. <laughs> Unless you was in the gym. <laughs> Don't play with me. Don't play with me. Don't play with me. And the other thing is because I tend to be a little perky to the people probably. People sometimes think I'll play about my kids. And when I tell you I don't, I mean it. But I also know a lot of moms, a lot of parents, especially from marginalized communities. And this goes to parents with disabilities. This goes to parents who are going to queer whatever. People will try to play in their face. And then they will say, well, why couldn't you figure out how to navigate these three dozen obstacles to present a version of parenting that looks like what I think parenting should look like. But right. my child is not going to leave my house and face what Chad is facing. Well, correct. So I have to prepare my child for the world that they are facing. Correct. And while I am preparing my child, I still have to deal with Karen, Becky, Chad, Todd, whatever. Right. 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 And I wanted people to think about while they're busy judging parents from our class communities, because people do, they love to judge. Right. And you'll see them judging everything from the groceries to how they talk to their kids. I was with a friend and her daughter was just having one of those days. Right. So her daughter's supposed to try and dart towards the street and the long ponytail. So my friend grabbed the ponytail to keep her child from running into the street. Because that's what she it was reachable. Instinct. Right. Some woman, you know, if you're having a hard time, you don't have to be so aggressive. The car would have been more aggressive. The car. <laughs> she just saved her daughter's life. But because of that conversational, those kinds of conversational, I wanted to include in this book that I know that a lot of time oh can you hear me yep okay sorry i think something technological happened <laughs> that crowdcast is just being a little shaky you froze for a second it's fine it's fine there's a question in the chat around if you could speak to um sort of like the genealogy of black women's exploitation over time and that connection to reproductive labor I'm gonna say this because 
some of that is a chapter for something that's coming up. Coming <laughs> out um, we have, as a culture, been taught repeatedly that Black women's bodies belong to everyone but Black women, that they exist to serve everyone but Black women, that they are absolutely violatable at any time in any way by anyone. And then we said, oh, that's not true, kind of. We right. still not really let go of that until someone's punching us in the eye culturally. Right. Right. And so then people will be offended by black women setting boundaries. And historically, generationally, whether we're talking about slavery or we're talking about after slavery when black women were being assaulted, and Reese Taylor case is a prime example of this. Right. For existing outside and walking, right, where their husbands might be paid. Um, some money for what had happened because as far as racism was concerned, they were available to whoever wanted them. To the idea that they are mammy, for lack of a better way of putting it, for emotional or other labor. Right. To even, you know, now the idea that somebody else gets to decide what parts of their body they show, whether or not the way that they have done their hair, their makeup, their earrings, or whatever, right? Right. I saw a thing on TikTok, which is a really ridiculous thing, but a girl said, mm, I don't want white women, I don't want to call me sis. She didn't want strangers calling her sis. Right. And she was specifically talking about white women. And I saw all of these white women rushing in to like make fun of this and get aggressive about it. And I was like, mm, that would be why she didn't want you to do that. Right. Yeah, right there. But I couldn't figure out why they were so bothered. And then I realized she had set a boundary and they couldn't handle Right. Her setting this boundary. And so when we're getting into like the reproductive justice and, and rape culture and all of this other, these other places where this spills over into, right? What we're seeing is people who don't believe that black women should have boundaries, that black women have selves to defend, that black women should be able to say no, to be honest, mm -hmm. and that black women should both serve their whatever whims and needs and also not make them feel guilty, culpable, whatever, right? We have a lot of listen to black women followed by weirdly fetish framing statements, right? Mm -hmm. Right, and I saw this with Stacey Abrams and I was just like, what is happening, right? She got out the vote and then some things I'm not gonna repeat because you all are not gonna come see me, Georgia. I already know how y'all feel about that. I mean, I'm, 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 not in this. I'm not in this. <laughs> right. Like that. Mm -mm. Like I, I'll be with you. We can I can swing on swing for you, but I ain't gonna say what they said. <laughs> watching that play out, watching people decide to masculinize her and all of these other very strange things. I was like, you all can't handle the fact that black women are right and that they exist and that they have survived. Mm -hmm. And then had the nerve to thrive, right? And we're seeing it play out over and over again. I'm not gonna tell you every black woman that is a target is somehow a perfect person. But I watched, this is a strange article we've seen. Someone blamed Beyonce's costumes for sex trafficking a few years ago in an article. I can't explain how we got from, I read the article, still can't, it didn't make no sense. Yeah, I mean, and, and honestly, there are lots of valid critiques and that just, that's just not one of them. <laughs> um, that's just, doesn't sound like it's one of them. No, I read the whole thing because I was ready to respond and then I was like, I don't, Yeah, you didn't make your case. Yeah, yeah. I think the other thing that I'm thinking about as it relates to reproductive labor is that one of the things that's advocated for, um, under the reproductive justice framework is the right to bodily autonomy, right? Like the, the right to make decisions for our bodies. Um, that is something that we view as a basic human right um, that all folks should have um, no matter where they are in the world. Um, and then in 2019, we saw these abortion bans sweep the South, right? You know, here in Georgia, we had a six week abortion ban introduced. Um, and our, the governor signed it. Um, and then, you know, a number of organizations, including the one that I work for, sued the state of Georgia, right? Like this okay. is, this is um, an infringement on our, on our human rights, on our civil rights. Um, and so abortion is still legal in the state of Georgia, but I, you, you talk a little bit about your abortion story in the book. Um, and you describe it basically as a life-saving uh, procedure for you. 
Um, and I was wondering if um, if you're comfortable, if you would yeah. want to share um, more about um, your thoughts about, um, well, one, what you went through after, like the aftermath and like how that's connected to like abortion as a feminist issue and how we think about it, but also who came to support you in that time. Um, and so, yeah, if you could just share a little bit about that. So I'm going to preface this by saying that um, I will believe pro-lifers care about life when they fight to do something about black women's maternal mortality rates. I will believe they care about life when they fight to do something about being able to afford to feed the children that you think women should have. And you believe that victims of sexual assault and other things should be protected. That is when we will have that conversation. So before you send me an email, please understand that all of this is the pleasant version. The other version, you don't want to meet her. Because some of y'all are going to feel like you want to write me an email after I say what I'm about to say next. Right. So I have two children. Um, I have been pregnant a total of five times. And that has been a couple of miscarriages that were your standard some 50% of pregnancies ending miscarriage. If I wasn't very pregnant, I had a miscarriage. Okay. Um, I, in both of those cases, then tried to get and had a child. I'm one of those people, I think they call them rainbow babies now. Well, both of my kids would be considered rainbow babies. Okay, fine. So with that last pregnancy, I knew pretty early that maybe something was amiss because I had been pregnant before and successfully before, and this was not the same thing. Yeah. Um, and I had gone to the doctor, he'd done all the things, and my doctor had even given, kind of given me a heads up that there was an issue with my placenta and blah, blah, blah. I hemorrhaged, there's a hospital trip, and then there is a long sojourn in which I had a doctor who did not do abortions. That was what he said. I still don't know the reason. I never did a clear explanation. And then a nurse called someone who was not on staff that night, or not on call that night, was not on staff that night, and she got out of her bed wow. at her house and called in her team because I was going to leave this world, right? It took two bags of blood, emergency midnight surgery. It was a whole thing. Right. And people later then tried to dissect how I describe it and whatever. And it's a very traumatic experience. And also, if you don't like it, oh, well, right? Right. When you're not talking about it like you're super grieving. I had had time to come to terms before I ever wrote about it and right. divorce myself right. from what had happened. Right. Because fundamentally, in the ER, they said, this is not a viable pregnancy. I had already... Okay, right? Mm -hmm. Before they ever sent me upstairs, I knew where we were because I was less than 20 weeks. Right. And not to be too graphic, but somebody had to come scrub the walls in my house before my kids could come back inside. Right. So I, was, I knew where I was. Right, right. So for the way that people talk about reproductive justice, people then say, well, you should have, you could have, you whatever. I had two living children to be there for. One of whom I had with a person who I wouldn't let watch a house plant. Didn't know that when I made the baby, but I understood that by the time I divorced him. So I needed to stay here for that child. I needed to stay here for my other child. I needed to stay here for my husband. Right. The options were not save both of us. That was never on the table. It was save me or don't save me. Right. And too often for black women in maternal mortality conversations, the baby sometimes survives, not always, but the women are sacrificed because again, we tend not to think of black women as having value or having a reason to exist. I got lucky at several turns. I couldn't figure out. So that dang same doctor came back with her daughter. And you know what her daughter looked like? Me. It was a white doctor with a black daughter. What? Because uh -huh. her daughter, she came and she asked if her daughter would come see me because her daughter was worried about me. And that's why we asked why. And her daughter walked in and we had the same hair. Wow. And I, right, and she encouraged me to file a complaint because we both knew what had happened. We couldn't prove it. But we both knew what had happened the night before. Because I was there for six hours with no pain meds and hemorrhaging. Right, right. We both knew what had happened. But it was a black nurse that called. It was a white doctor with a black daughter that came. You understand what I am saying to you, right?
Wow. And so when we're talking about these things and, and the people who were angry at me after, for the record, were right. you all just in that gesture? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but when politicians say that they are concerned about unborn children, they want to whatever, whoever stands in front of clinics, whatever. And see, I would clinic escort, but again, I don't trust you. You should let me do it, but you, I don't trust me. Oh, because we always gonna say we're always looking for volunteers or feminists. Yeah, but see, <laughs> the way I'm made up. Listen, um, because I've seen, I've seen some of the things. I told this story once on Twitter. I'm gonna tell it in here briefly. I was, I went with a woman I did not know to have a procedure, and this was years ago. We were both at the Pursuit of Domestic Violence Center here in, in town. And the guy that she was running from, he had cried about her having this procedure, all of these things. It was a whole dramatic moment. But he assaulted her to put that baby in her. He beat her regularly. And the reason she was having the procedure is because he had put a cigarette out on her and she had visions of what it would mean for this child to have him in their life. So she was doing the best possible thing she could. Right. She was not giving a monster another victim. And I think sometimes people look at abortion as somehow being about simply that fetus. Yeah. You don't know the world somebody is existing in. Exactly. You don't know whether there's something abusive going on, whether there are other concerns going on. Right. Heck, you don't even know what conversation they had with their doctor. Right. Because it can be their blood pressure. It can be any of the number of things. Right. 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 And in my case, after all of that was over, I had a hysterectomy a little bit later. Yeah. Um, a partial hysterectomy. I had a partial hysterectomy because they wanted to do a bunch of tests and I had already had the conversation that we were not getting pregnant again. And when they had the hysterectomy, uh, when they examined the lining of my uterus, I had cancer cells. So that pregnancy would have been a bad thing. Yeah. Because estrogen and cancer itself, they don't go together. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely yeah. not. Wow. And so I feel like people are not clear on the fact that abortion is medical care. Right. That is it. And you don't know why people need an abortion any more than you know why people might need a kidney transplant. Exactly. Business. That meat soup that you're in is the only thing you get to control. No one else's. Yeah. And that's, very <laughs> <laughs> and that's something that um that's something that we were really trying to like hammer home with people like mm -hmm. part of our like outreach right like think about uh, abortion as it relates to reproductive health care like it's not a mm -hmm. that is outside of reproductive health care um it's very much one that is included in it and so I think that um your story is just really, really powerful um, because in your case, if you weren't able to access that procedure, it would have, um, it could have resulted in you losing your life, right? Like it was an actual life-saving. Um, and I had someone argue with me recently when I said, abortion is a life-saving procedure. And they're like, no, it's not. And I'm like, it is a life-saving procedure. And, and often, often, I think that that is a thing that people don't know because they don't know what's trying to do medical care. Exactly. Uh, I also want to say this just because I saw the question in the chat. Someone asked about what brings me joy as a mother, what brings me joy as a parent. Oh, yeah. um, watching my kids discover stuff is the funniest thing in the world to me. Um, also, though we will never tell them this, how excited they get about food, don't ask. But I have six foot tall children mm -hmm. and they still do their little dancey dance when they eat. Mm -hmm. And we just don't, we don't tell them that I think that's adorable. Yeah. I know, but Right. Um, but also just the little people become big people. They talk to you about stuff and they have all these interests and they do things. Mm -hmm. Right. And you get to like build a human. Mm -hmm. Like you get to make a whole person and then like they go forth and they do stuff. They do things with their own brains. Right. And things that maybe you wouldn't even do. Right. I have an eight year old and I'm like, huh. I would have taken that in a very different direction than you just took that, but okay, that's very, that's fascinating. Hmm. My oldest can draw. My oldest can like beautifully, both of my kids can draw. You know what I can do? Stick figures. 
they're like brilliant like, masterpieces. Right. And I'm just like, really? And they have like interests and hobbies and like like nobody tells you before parenthood that the coolest part is watching them become like fully fledged people. Yeah. Right. And they'll they'll do things differently than you would have. They'll come up with ideas you never did, right? And then like they give you a hug and a kiss and you're like, oh great. I did that. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a question in the chat that says, who are some of the black feminists that you look to? Um, I'm not sure everybody I look to describe themselves as a feminist, but we're gonna go with that. Um, because my grandmother definitely never did, but that's fine. Um, I have an, an aunt who um, will be mad about this, my Aunt Denise. Um, and she'll be mad because I'm about to talk, I'm about, to talk about it. Um, <laughs> he is a tidy terrorist in a grandma suit. Like she's so fierce and is always in something, right? If it's the school, if it's whatever. Mm -hmm. And I really look to the people like that, as well as the names you're gonna expect to hear, right? Alice Walker, to some degree, I understand that there are complicated things there, I'm not saying they're not. There are parts of her older work that I love, there's later stuff I don't. Bell Hooks, again, same thing. Um, to some degree, Beyonce, because I've watched her become Mm -hmm. And I think there's something really great about the becoming process in the public eye. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of respect for Charlene Carruthers. I have a lot of respect for a lot of black women who we both see and then ones we don't see. Tamara Manasi, who runs the violence intervention program in Chicago. Um, I have a friend, Jamie Nesbitt Golden, right, who's a journalist in Chicago, all of these things. And the thing is, um, one of your people, Chesha Burke, I had to think about Chesha's last name, was called Chesha. Um, who writes horror and other stuff and is also an academic. And the thing is, a lot of Black feminist voices that I am thinking of, that I would say I look to, they're doing things that are pretty mundane, right? And not mundane in the sense that they're not doing important things, but right. mundane in the sense that the work that they're doing in their communities and with their neighborhoods or, or whatever, is the stuff we expect black women to do and we don't comment on. And it's become increasingly important to me over the years to give people their flowers for that day-to-day -day work. Yeah. Right? I'm gonna tell you as someone who has sort of transmitted myself along this line, it gets easier, right, as fame and fortune kind of show up to do certain things, right? It's very easy when you have the resources to just write a check. Yeah. It is not easy be the person who is out there every day, figuring out a budget, making sure somebody picked up the thing, did the stuff, organizing so that you have a good response, writing a newsletter, all of those things. I am not an organizer, I'm never gonna be an organizer, because I am a, I am disorganized. But I have a lot of respect for the folks who show up and show out day to day and make sure that the the mission of this moves along, right? And when we think about like the civil rights movement, we tend to think of Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. But I think a lot about the women who made sure that meals were cooked, people were bonded out, jail support, mutual aid funds, all of those things. Right. Because progress is sort of happening in the way that we move together, not just by who is in front. Right, right. I'm I'm really appreciating that you're lifting that up. Um, because it makes me think about Angela Davis's um, essay about um, Black women's roles in the community of slaves, right? Where she talks about Black women's like everyday activities. She calls them survival-oriented activities as those everyday mundane daily activities um, were what sustained the community, right? That's what kept everyone clothed, fed, um, taken care of. Um, and so that's some of that emotional labor, right? Like some of that invisible labor or devalued labor um, that is not always lifted up or appreciated. And so I'm glad that you lift that up. And I, that was something that I saw as a threat throughout your book, right? Like you talk about the different roles that um, your family members play and the reverence that uh, folks have for elders in, in your family, right? And it kind of reminds me of um, my own where my mom had me when she was in high school, so we lived in my grandmother's house, and in my grandmother's house, like some of my cousins lived in my grandmother's house too, right? And 
my mom was still in school, but she had childcare at the house because that's where we lived. And so she was able to get, go to school, go to work, right? Like, so thinking about some of the mundane things that seem really simple, um, but that allow us to um, better access some of the fundamental things that we need to live and to survive, um, I think is important. And I just think that you eloquently like weave your personal stories in there that lift up the like beauty and um, the love that's at the center um, of hood feminisms, right? Like feminisms, I like how you say like your introduction to it because like mm-hmm. my introduction was not through feminist theory. That's not no. that was not my entry point. <laughs> it was not, <laughs> and it's funny because even now I tell I've told the story of other things on this one here. The most, one of the most radically, aggressively feminist moments that my grandmother had with me. I, at 15, about to turn 16, wanted, I was a senior in high school and I wanted to just take the GED and drop out of high school. I was talking to an old black woman from the deep south whose grandmother had been a slave. So some of you right now in the audience are looking at each other and saying, You said what to who? You? Who said that? <laughs> <laughs> Mama, I ain't say that. I ain't got nothing to do with it. She ain't mean it. <laughs> she ain't mean it. My grandmother had just had a radical mastectomy, so I don't know how she did this. But I was talking to her, and somehow she both managed to lean up on the arm that there was no leaning on. I don't know. I don't know. And grabbed me with the arm that came from, I don't know, <laughs> space, right? Like, I don't understand what happened. Yet. I got the fastest lesson, the fastest course correction humanly possible um and at the time i thought okay fine it'll make you happy whatever right like really i was thinking like please don't kill me oh god right i graduated from high school at 16 because please don't kill me right um but it turned out that those lectures about what i needed to do for myself what i needed to do for other people Mm -hmm. have been the best advice, the most feminist advice, yeah. over and over and over again. And I hear myself repeating a lot of it, yeah. right? Sometimes I talk to young women who are entering the workforce or whatever, and I find myself parroting my grandmother's things about making sure that you understand that even if they pretend that they're your friend, they may not be your friend. So know who you're talking to before you say the thing, right? And that's still true. It is it's still true. Real. It's relevant. Right. And it's it's important knowledge. It's 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 life saving knowledge. Right. And my grandmother was born in 1924. Right. right? She didn't always land it right, right? She was always trying to get me to be more ladylike and she couldn't pull that out. Granted, no one could. But she was also always harping on the idea that you needed to have your own, you need to be able to take care of yourself. Even if people tell you you can't do, you do. So I've listened to her. And now I'm hitting this really weird age point where, because I'm in my 40s. And we are all, Gen X is also talking about like retirement thoughts and whatever. And I'm finding out my grandmother was big on us working. It's a huge thing for her over and over and over again. One of the things, and I'm going to talk about this more, um, another thing I'm working on, is that women who didn't have that kind of advice as Mm -hmm. for Gen X, as we are hitting the end of things, Mm -hmm. we don't have funds to retire Mm -hmm. because... We did the traditional route, mm. right? And not just that retirement is this thing. They don't have funds where they can stop working. They right. have suddenly had to start working in some cases, right? Right, right, right. And I, I did this, I talked about this on TikTok, and it turned into a whole, like, 300,000 people. It's, like, the biggest video I've ever, ever done on there for the thing I was on chain. But the stories that came back to me out of that, I've been like, oh, yeah, you the best feminist advice was going to be God loves the child that's got their own. Yes. Right? Like how how is that gonna be the thing? Nah, that's not what I was expecting. I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting that. Right. And it wasn't like she was saying it like, you know, you need to be rich or you have to be super right. capitalist or any of the things. She was still talking about taking care of your neighbors and all of that. But she was basically saying, cover your own behind. We'll put it that yeah. way. Yeah. And I think a lot about the other things like that, right? The people like Miss Longley, Miss Miller, who's the one that made sure I knew how to code switch and how to eat at the table, and all of these things that seem really innocuous, but that 
when our kids leave our communities and go forth into the wider world, these are the skills that right. make a difference. And in, respectability is not is not what is promised. But when you have to deal with the world in front of you in order to make the world you want to see, right. those skills sometimes come from the women who are just part of the fabric of your community. Exactly. Just the people who show up every day. It comes from, heck, there was a, a, a trans woman that lived um, a few doors down from us when I was growing up. And she was always, and it was not like we didn't know or, you know, she was very upfront about it. She was very good about educating people about her life and her transition and all of these things. And it wasn't in the way that you would think. It was more about if somebody asked her a question, she would answer, right? Mm -hmm. But I remember her saying very casually one day, um, I'm trying to remember how she phrased it, but it was basically, we are all in this together. We are all women facing different things. Mm -hmm. And I found that, especially as I have grown and I'm watching some very peculiar anti-trans stuff come out of places, people are hung up on things that fundamentally have nothing to do with survival, have nothing to do with anybody thriving. Right. And I think a lot about how our communities right, wherever you fall in this spectrum of communities. We're facing down fascism and people are still arguing about the dumbest things that have no impact on them, right? right. Whether it is like the weird bathroom bill thing, which, right. let me just kneecap the person talking to you. Like, as an ally, let me just kneecap the person that says that to you. Like, don't even, just point, I'll just point. That's what, like, him over the thing. <laughs> right, like let me just do that because like we can talk to them, but like there's no reason. Yeah. But I think a lot about the ways that as we grow and as we change, black communities in particular, none of us are safe until all of us are safe. Period. Right. And the same is true when we're talking about anti-Asian violence. Yeah. It's starting to happen when we're talking about immigration conversations. When we're talking about indigenous rights. Right. Like pick your thing. You know, ableism, whatever. The only way we all get out of this is if we are working together towards that liberation. Right. Because the kicker is that for anyone listening, it's going to be like, well, those are all issues that don't affect, affect my community. Texas just showed us what happens to poor white people. Mississippi just showed us what happens to poor white people. If you think you are not in this with BIPOC folks, you are wrong because yeah. Those folks said, we will give you a power bill that costs more than your house and then expect you to pay it and stay with our chest. Well, we'll give you 10 years to pay it. Right. If all of the other people left, right, it would still be y'all on the spot. Exactly. There needs to be a bottom, always. <laughs> yeah, I think... Um... Yeah, I think that the way that you, you've written it out, the way that you've written this book kind of actually highlights that all of these things are Black issues, right? So when you talk about the issue of patriarchy, though the conversation might not be the same as it is in the mainstream feminist movements, um, because necessarily um, our relationships to um, men in our lives are, are very different um, than the relationships women have, uh, uh, cis white women have to us, uh, cis white men. Um, and the role and the relationship between patriarchy and patriarchal violence and sometimes mm -hmm. patriarchal violence as it is, you know, um, wielded by the state, right? Um, I mean, and I'm going to say this because I think a lot about the times that like the dope boys that hang out, they call you Miss Lady and they'll carry your groceries too. Right. A lot of them are on the street because they're really in foster care. Yep. Um, versus, and it's not all white kids for somebody, there's a certain kind of rich white kid we see that gets off on harming people, right? Like pulling the wings off of, of the proverbial fly. And we've seen this with things about and I think that when we are talking about that spectrum of patriarchal violence, there's an idea that somehow the patriarchy 
has all the power. Like all men have all the same levels of power. Right. But trans men don't have access to that power. Men of color don't necessarily have access to that. It doesn't mean they can't do harm. Right. It just means that we are facing a situation where the pressure from outside our communities is making things worse inside our communities sometimes. And I think that relationship means that sometimes the, the diversion from the patriarchy's influence does fall to the community, not just to women, not just to men, but does fall to the community to speak up and intervene. It right. does mean sometimes looking at who is talking to our youth, what they're talking about, and really parsing what that message is bringing to them, right? Because again, it is easier to see a future for yourself if people talk to you about your future as opposed to talking to you about what you shouldn't do. Right. 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 So there's all of that construction. And then we have this thing on the other side where we're starting to see what some white feminist voices talk about, the violence and the anger white boys feel towards young white women and their mothers and whatever. But they don't seem quite yet to know why. And then you kind of have to sit there, at least I do as an outside observer, who used to be married to a white guy and kind of go, well, no one tells them that they don't deserve everything they want when they want it. In fact, they're sold a bill that the world is their oyster and they deserve it all. Yeah. And then the ones that can't compete for whatever reason, they don't have any coping skills. Right. So what they do have is a target because as we saw with the Kavanaugh trials and others, yep. white women were standing there sacrificing their children. Yeah, like, <laughs> like with their whole chest. Right. To Let me walk my daughter up here and tell her it's okay for some man to grab her. Right, and she has a and she has a woman for Kavanaugh shirt on, um, and so it just like it it brings us back to that conversation around um, even feminism is not like a monolithic identity marker, right? Like I need you to like <laughs> I need you to name your set, <laughs> like. Right. I need you to, I need, I need more. You can't just say I'm a feminist. That's not enough information for me. Um, I need to know a little bit more about what you believe, um, how you are thinking about the issues, right? What issues you believe are important issues or the issues that should be raised up or made a priority. And then how does your positionality inform what you think is a priority, right? Um, and so I like how you kind of tease that out and you talk about, um, even carceral feminism, right? Like um, a form of feminism that um, is anti-black, um, a form of feminism that causes um, irreversible harm to not just individual black folks, but also black communities when they have, you know, um, members of their community, important members of the communities removed, disappeared from their communities. Um, and so I think that this makes this even more timely, right, to say, uh, as a call to action, like there's work to be done um, and that the analysis that's that's currently dominating um, the mainstream movement is, is severely underdeveloped um, and for it to meet the needs of all people, right? What's needed, what's necessary. And so I'm curious, who is this book for? Like who needs to be engaging with this text? So first, and foremost, I want people who want the world to be better to engage with this text, right? right. Because I think sometimes we will get frustrated because we know if there's a lot of problems, we don't know which problem to pick to focus on. And that's not me saying you can only focus on the problems in this book. This is me saying that it, if we put energy into solving these, it gets easier to solve those others that are built on the backs of these. Then, um, and this I kind of see that a little bit in the first chapter when I talked about how some white feminists really do harm. They really do, right? White feminists who would like to stop doing harm or who would like to fix what's going on over there in that set, <laughs> I would like them to read it because I would like them to talk to each other. And I know Robin DeAngelo has a book called White Fragility and there's some critiques and whatever. The thing is though, that book mostly speaks to the kind of white feminist voices I don't want to talk to. Yeah, I don't want, it's not, that's not my ministry. That is her ministry, that is not my ministry. So like, let's, you work, right? Because there's kind of a spectrum here where I think that when people are reading this, there are gonna be people who can read it and feel like they are empowered and ready to go. There are gonna be people who parse this book as an attack on their own internal self, right? 
And that is your mission to work out with your guys. It's not, again, not my business. But I think that there will be people who will come to this book, come away and come back, and come away and come back probably several times before they're ready to hear me. And that is not to say I am the last stop. Right. There will be someone who says more than me. I know, like, I am, for instance, I am a reductionist. I am not a prison abolitionist. And I understand all of the arguments for abolition. But January 6th just happened. And I got to tell you, there's just still some people I think need to be someplace <laughs> outside of the general public. Not right? uh, inside here. Somewhere else. Yeah, they, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. <laughs> but... I am the kind of person that thinks that we shouldn't be locking people up for drugs or other nonviolent offenses. Right. 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 I'm the kind of person that thinks that you got in a fist fight in the bar, this is not a reason for you to go to jail. Right. The kind of people I think should go to jail are serial predators yeah. and terrorists who do things like gouge out eyes. Um <laughs> like I get very specific, okay? I get very pointed. Incredibly specific. The- um, Sorry, well, but the reason I say that is because I really think white feminism has to do some work within itself because it does have access to power. It does have access to right policy. And not that this book is for white feminists, but this book is for people who are willing to talk with white feminism and willing to try to redirect white feminism too. It is also though for the girl who is, and I know someone's gonna be like, but the girl who's standing up doing hair, who likes to listen to books while she works, um, the girl who works in the liquor store, the girl who is the candy lady. It is for all of us. Yeah. Because you don't get to where I am without Miss Josephine, Miss Dorothy, all of those folks, right? Beauty shop Dorothy. Okay. Paula's done, taught me math, all of that. Those folks are also part of my path here. Right, 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 right. Yeah. I think that's that's something that I really appreciated about it as someone who's constantly having my head in some like really dense theory. Um, Your book was a book of fresh air because I could see myself reading it. I could see my mom reading it. I could see my cousins reading it. Um, Shout out to them if they're on this podcast right now. Uh, There's a lot of people, which is really weird. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I'm like, we can't see them. But hey, y'all. Yeah. And uh, I feel like this has been a great conversation. So I will probably get my mom like a new copy because I wrote all up in this one. But um, yeah, I just feel like it is for everybody. I feel like it's written in a way that I really appreciate it because you make some really complex um, things like the the functions of superstructures in our lives, but you weave in your personal experience in such a way that makes uh, the reader able to see themselves um, reflected in it. So I really, really appreciate that. And I just wanted to say thank you for being in conversation. Um, thank you. And if you send me an address, I'll send your mama a side copy. Ooh, I got you. <laughs> and then we can uh, throw it back to Dartricia now. Oh yeah, oh my. We've been talking for an hour and a half. I didn't realize what happened. Yeah. <laughs> in a moment it's been real cute it was a great hour and a half y'all um wow this was incredible thank you so much mickey and jaleesa um i just want to remind everyone that this conversation is recorded i will likely go back and rewatch it again so i can take notes um but yes thank you for an amazing conversation and thank you to auburn avenue for the great resources in the chat um please remember that the resources will still be there you can come back to the chat and again take notes um buy your book directly from Kara's books and more we are a feminist bookstore this book is hood feminism click the teal button at the bottom you want it send it to your mama them for real and also yes (laughs) and Kara circle who hosts this program is a nonprofit and we are primarily supported by individuals like you. So if you've enjoyed tonight's event, please consider making contribution of any amount to, to support the work of feminist community building in the South. And thank you. Good night, y'all. Good night. Good night.